Good morning. Um, welcome. Uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Mohsen Khan. I'm a senior fellow at the Hariri Center here at the Family Council. Uh, I want to welcome all of you uh, to this, this um, event and the discussion on the political economy of subsidy reforms in MENA, progress and challenges. And uh, let me, we have an excellent panel with us, um, and I will introduce them uh, very shortly. Uh, just to remind, I've been told, I have to remind everyone that this is, a, this is going to be tweeted, and uh, it's AC Energy, and uh, it, uh, we will have uh, um, uh, three members, three uh, people on the panel with us. Uh, the first is uh, Daniela Grisani, who is uh, Deputy Director of the Middle East and Central Asia Department at the IMF. Um, uh, prior to joining the IMF, she was uh, the Vice President of uh, MENA at the World Bank, and she will be talking about uh, giving a sort of a, her views on subsidy of, um, uh, reforms in, in MENA, and uh, I expect advertising the new uh, report that the IMF has come up with, which is actually outside. Uh, so if anyone has picked it up, has it picked it up, please do. Um, the second speaker is, is Justin Dunn. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you here. Uh, Justin is uh, the Saudi Aramco Fellow at uh, an Energy and Middle East Scholar at the Oxford Institute for Energy Subsidies in Oxford. Um, he's a former research fellow with uh, the Y Initiative at Harvard University as well. Uh, so welcome. He's an expert on, on uh, the energy issues in the MENA region, apart from other regions, but MENA region too. And our third speaker is, we'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Malik uh, Kavariti, who is a former minister of uh, energy and mineral resources in, from Jordan. Um, he will be <coughs> coming, as you can see, via Skype. Uh, prior to his appointment at the Jordanian cabinet, uh, he served as chairman of the National Electric Power Company, NEPCO. Anyone knows Jordan? You know NEPCO. Uh, and and uh, he will be talking about energy issues and uh, particularly his more recent interest in renewable and sustainable energy. So uh, each speaker will have about 10 minutes and uh, we'll start in the order in which they were introduced and then we will move on to Q&A from the floor. So with that, Daniela, I'd like to open it up to you. Thank you very much. I think that um I probably don't need to explain too carefully why the IMF is so concerned about subsidies in the MENA region. Um, as part of my advertising campaign, um, I would like to remind everybody that the last year the IMF published a book on energy subsidies that looked not just at the MENA region but uh, across the world and made a um, pretty uh, detailed case against energy subsidies uh, in terms of their um, being costly, they are not delivering uh, benefits to poor people, um, being uh, distortive in terms of um, uh, the economy, not just because they distort uh, consumption, encourage people to consume way too much energy, but also because they um, distort investment towards uh, away from uh, industries that are more labor intensive towards industries that are uh, more uh, energy intensive, um, have negative impact on health, traffic, and so on. I don't want to go too much in detail in this case. I feel that we, we have tried to make it very forcefully, but I'd be happy to, uh, to argue that case in more detail if, if there is a need to do so later. What I would like to advertise today is the report that Mosin said is outside, so I'll hold it up. It's um, essentially um, a study of recent reform experiences to try to distill the lessons um, from what works, about what works and what does not work um, so that we can help design this kind of reforms in countries that are now either um, entering the second wave of subsidy reform or beginning to think about it. And this is really, um, I think, one of the 
important developments that we have seen in the last few years. The MENA region, which is the region where subsidies um, are the most pervasive, uh, half of energy subsidies in the whole world are actually in the MENA region, um, and cost something like 8% of GDP on average. Um, these countries have been facing mostly fiscal pressures in the last few years that have pushed them towards beginning to tackle these difficult um, reforms. Um, what we have seen has been a wave of um, gradual price increases in fuel products, in energy products. Um, we have seen um, a much more um, deliberate effort to engage in communication, debate, policy discussion about uh, the costs of subsidies and the benefits of reforming them. And we have also seen um, among the countries that are not um, really suffering from major fiscal pressure, such as all the sporting countries, we've also seen there a strong interest and early steps towards tackling uh, energy subsidies. Now, the, there are, I think, what, what maybe I, I can spend some more time on at this, at this point in the presentation is, what is it that we've actually learned by looking at these uh, reforms? And first of all, as I said, there's been that fiscal pressures have been a very important driver. Um, we have had just last weekend, we have seen Egypt taking very uh, bold steps towards reducing energy subsidies, um, which I think demonstrate uh, the awareness of the problem as well as the determination to tackle the problem across different countries. Um, the old question about why do we need to do subsidy reform? seems to have been overtaken in most countries by the question of how do we do it and how do we do it successfully. Now in this context, the, um, the work that we have done has been um, looking at the recent experience in the MENA countries that have began, began to tackle subsidy as well as other countries that have had similar experiences in recent, <coughs> in recent years. And um, what, uh, what we've learned is that there are a number of common factors in countries that have successfully taken these initial steps. And I think the most um, important uh, common factors have been reform has been prepared. Um, countries have engaged in discussions, have raised awareness, have looked at um, the, the, the winners and losers of subsidies and the winners and losers of reforms. Um, and they have uh, communicated actively around these, these issues to make people aware. Um, in other, um, other uh, success factors, to call them this way, have been to make sure that the people most vulnerable to um, increasing prices People that are poor, people that depend on, um, on subsidies more than others, even though they generally are not the largest beneficiaries, um, that there are uh, measures put in place to prevent these people from falling uh, below the poverty line or from for helping them um, deal with these price increases. <coughs> All the countries that have been successful at introducing initial steps towards subsidies reform have also been able to scale up uh, mitigation measures, focus on poor people. Now, some countries have also gone beyond uh, mitigation measures for poor people and also provided support for a larger segment of the population, keeping in mind that, in fact, poor are actually not the main beneficiaries of subsidies and creating um, a, a transitional support for subsidies reform requires also buying in the support of groups other than the poor. Um, I think um, 
Another uh, measure that has been uh, shared by countries that have been successful has been the introduction of automatic adjustment uh, mechanisms. Once countries have spent a significant amount of political capital in increasing prices, it is helpful to depoliticize the future price setting by establishing a mechanism that allows these uh, price increases not to be eroded or in fact to allow the clients in, in oil prices to be reflected, of energy prices I should say, to be reflected in domestic uh, price uh, level. Now, as I was hinting at, but I don't want to pre preempt this discussion because I think Mosin is keen on having us talk a little bit about the political economy of subsidy reform. Go, I think it goes without saying that the countries that have been successful in these early steps in towards um, subsidy reform have been especially mindful of the coalitions that can uh, sabotage subsidy reform and address uh, directly some of their concern. And this has been, again, a very important part of their experience. Now, the last, the last thing I, I would like to say is that as we are seeing this much greater interest in addressing this very difficult problem, there are many things that we also are learning from looking at these cases um, that may be applicable to countries that have not yet started uh, or have not taken major steps towards subsidies reform. Many of these countries are oil exporting countries. For them, energy subsidies are not a big source of fiscal pressure, even though they are a source of other pressures, both distortion, exports, and so on. Um, and the factors that we have identified that these countries we feel also need to keep in mind as they take future steps towards subsidies reform are really, again, to prepare a debate that identifies the costs of subsidies, that identifies the benefits from reforming, um, that um, creates a, a common, under a shared understanding within the countries about the need and the um, requirements for making progress in the areas and how benefits can be shared. Of course, these countries as well, even though they tend to be much richer countries than oil importing countries, will need to look at social safety nets to protect the most vulnerable segments of their population. And um, they will need to, um, I think, going forward, focus more of their energy in this um, political economy uh, factors that, as I said, I don't want to preempt because I know Mossin wants to go there. So that's all I have to say for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Daniela. That leads nicely into what Justin is going to talk about, so Justin, the floor is yours. I agree. Please. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Mohsen, uh, for the kind introduction. I also thank the Atlantic Council and IMF for the kind invitation, and all of you for coming here this early uh, Thursday. Um, so I'm going to start off with uh, somewhat of a bold uh, statement. And that statement is, I believe that the era of energy subsidization, at least in the Middle region, is dead. And that's my belief. And that does not mean, though, uh, that uh, this uh, beast is not going to continue kicking for uh, some time. But I think that it is decisively over, at least to the extent that there is now the realization across the region that uh, energy subsidization has imposed uh, significant burdens on the national economies of the region and also on their energy sectors as well. So many of the countries right now, if they're not at least taking steps to address these issues, at least they understand conceptually that uh, energy subsidization is a problem, whether they choose to continue to go down that path uh, or not. But uh, this realization, uh, where did it come from? Well, basically, uh, there are three main reasons. Uh, one reason, of course, is at least in the energy-rich MENA countries, the crippling energy deficits, and most of these deficits began to appear around 2007, 2008, 2009, uh, in most um, of the MENA countries that um, export natural gas or uh, oil. And um, 
what occurred was that there was uh, this issue that is known as the iron scissors, and, and it's quite an unenviable position uh, to be in if you're an energy-rich uh, developing country, and is basically comprised of uh, two main, let's say, strands. And uh, one issue, of course, is that uh, you have declining investment due to energy subsidization or prices kept below, let's say, market value, so declining investment in uh, your natural gas fields or oil fields. And, and just to preface the rest of my presentation, I'm going to focus uh, mostly on natural gas as opposed to oil. So you have declining investment uh, in these fields, and many of these fields, of course, are mature. And because they're mature uh, fields, uh, it takes much more investment in order to uh, at least maintain the rate of production that you had previously or even to increase it. So uh, production declines, you have, lower, you have reduced investment. And then also you have a complicating factor, and this complicating factor is uh, uh, subsidies, subsidization tends to lead towards <coughs> overconsumption. And uh, overconsumption uh, has uh, certain issues uh, related to that as well because then these countries are incurring <coughs> significant opportunity cost in the sense that uh, they are not able to export enough oil or natural gas, which is a crucial hard currency generator. And instead, they're redirecting or allocating uh, what was previously exported to the internal market, where, of course, the prices are much less. So then the economy has a type of double whammy, whereby you have declining investment, declining production, then you have increasing consumption at the same time. So this concept is known as the iron scissors. Uh, so the realization of the iron scissors, uh, that was uh, one of the impetuses, we could say, for these MENA countries to recognize that energy subsidization cannot continue along the path that um, they were on previously. And then, of course, there are environmental issues as well. Uh, energy subsidization tends to lead to uh, higher than typical rates of uh, carbon intensity and other forms of pollution. So now, of course, with uh, climate change on most people's minds, uh, that notion of, let's say, lowering your carbon intensity, even in nations such as China is, um, is, is quite concerned about lowering carbon intensity. This is now at least ostensibly um, on the books for many of the MENA countries. And then um, lastly, uh, the budgetary strains that Daniela, of course, uh, mentioned uh, earlier. So uh, if we look at, let's say, the GCC countries, uh, the budgetary strains, uh, even for the major oil producers are, 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 are pretty significant, <coughs> considering that there has been a significant expansion of an already robust welfare state in the wake of the Arab Spring uh, in order to, uh, let's say, co-opt or, let's say, mitigate uh, any type of uh, social political uh, discontent. So if we look at uh, what is known as the break-even oil price, uh, now we all know that the break-even oil price is the price per barrel that an oil exporting country must receive in order to remain solvent, at least in its, um, in its national budget. So if we go back to about 2003, the average break-even price was about 30 to $40 uh, per barrel that an oil exporting country, at least in the GCC, had to obtain in order to remain uh, solvent. Uh, fast forward to 2013, 2014, the average break-even oil price is now about, uh, averages about $100 or so, meaning that now these countries need to obtain about $100 per barrel in order to maintain solvency in their national budgets. I mean, so uh, these are all quite uh, significant issues, and, and this is what has driven the realization that uh, there must be at least some modification or evolution of uh, the previous status quo. But uh, what I would like to do, I'd like to go into the history and origin of energy subsidization in the MENA region, at least quite briefly. And, and there are three main strands with that. Uh, one is philosophical, uh, the other is political, and um, the last one I would say is economic. Now, if we look at philosophically, of course, uh, in the era of decolonization uh, in the MENA region from the 1950s until 1970s, uh, there was this uh, notion that in order to inculcate, uh, let's say, uh, political legitimacy, uh, there must be some type of, um, let's say, wealth transfer uh, initiated. And uh, that was with the creation of what is known often as the Arab social contract. And uh, energy was a significant component of the Arab social contract. And um, in particular, uh, the idea was that uh, energy is a public utility or energy is a public good, uh, much like water, we could say, uh, having access to clean water. So, uh, so uh, as a result, uh, the idea was formed that uh, why should the populace have to uh, pay for what is its natural birthright? And um, 
what was also uh, inherent within this type of conception is that uh, the government is only holding energy assets in trust for the people. So it's a patrimony of the nation, i.e. the people, as opposed to uh, the government per se. Now whether that worked out in practice is a, a different issue, but at least these were the philosophical underpinnings of, of that particular uh, notion. And then of course we also have uh, political uh, issues as well. So again, going back to the era of decolonization, 1950s <coughs> to 1970s, uh, the Arab world was mainly split between two factions. Uh, we could say that one faction is known as the Rejectionist Front, and the Rejectionist Front were more or less Republican, secular governments. Um, so if we look at Algeria, uh, Libya at that time under uh, Muammar Gaddafi, uh, if we look, of course, at Egypt under Nasser, uh, Syria as well, Iraq, these were all Republican uh, governments, and they were known as the Rejectionist Front. And uh, they were against the neoclassical economic system that was encouraged uh, post-World uh, War II. And part and parcel of that, of course, was what was known as Arab Socialism, which was what many of these countries began to develop as well. And with all the ideas, of course, with uh, wealth redistribution inherent within these political uh, philosophies. And then on the other side of the spectrum, you had uh, mostly monarchies. I would say they were all monarchies, actually, to be honest. And uh, they had monarchical uh, political systems. And uh, they were allied with the West. And um, during this period, the 50s and 1970s, you had a, a, quite a significant era of uh, social political discontent. And uh, many of us tend to forget that. And I would say that the legitimacy crises were actually as significant as what uh, many of the countries are facing right now in the wake of the Arab Spring in terms of the prol proliferation of, um, of uh, certain Marxist ideologies and also Arab socialists, uh, or Arabism, actually, Arabism. Uh, being a, quite a significant ideology at that time. And it, it was quite a legitimate crisis uh, for many of the, the monarchies uh, that are in uh, the region, and they had to deal with that. And one of the ways to deal with that was the idea of co-opting um, the opposition. And um, that was, uh, let's say, facilitated by the creation of a vast welfare apparatus. And uh, that was done accordingly uh, in many of these countries, at least on uh, the more conservative end of the political uh, spectrum. And then uh, lastly, of course, you have the economic argument. And the economic argument is comprised of uh, two main themes. Uh, one is macroeconomic. And um, many of the countries wanted to create a modern industrial economy. And uh, one of the ways that they thought to do that was to base it on the back of the natural gas molecule. And uh, the natural gas molecule is quite mutable, uh, meaning that uh, you can create a lot of products uh, from the natural gas molecule. So the idea was to create uh, uh, quite a robust uh, downstream, natural gas downstream industry and also uh, energy intensive industries as well. Uh, so of course we have like uh, cement and also for downstream industries, uh, you know, we also have uh, petrochemicals and fertilizers and, and what have you. And the idea was that it would facilitate technology transfer uh, and create the sinews, we could say, of a modern industrial economy. Uh, so uh, the idea in order to get this started was through uh, granting a quite low-priced natural gas uh, feedstock to uh, these uh, industries. And the idea was that jobs would be created from this as well, uh, even though <coughs> these are not labor-intensive uh, industries, they're quite capital-intensive. But at least that was uh, the idea. And then, of course, you have the ideas of increasing energy access uh, for um, the poor segments of uh, the populace and, and, and so on. So that was also another economic reason that was used in justification of uh, these uh, policies. But we have to, we have to dig deep in this and unpack this. So what precisely is a subsidy? Uh, and, and I think this is important. And I, this is not necessarily uh, the place where I'm going to decisively uh, answer this uh, question. But it, it is a bit difficult to define, because there are many different definitions of what constitutes uh, a, a subsidy, uh, you know, depending on the perspective and depending on which organization you're dealing with. Uh, but we could say, more or less, the most common definition is governmental assistance uh, given to consumers <coughs> to either keep uh, the price below the cost of production or given to producers to keep the price above, let's say, market prices, uh, which would ensure a steady profit uh, for uh, these uh, entities. And more or less, we could say that uh, you know, this is the most common uh, definition. But I mean, using that definition, then we run into several problems, because there's not necessarily a liberalized market in many of these countries. So then uh, we need a benchmark in order to judge what what is a subsidy and whether a subsidy is, 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 is being created or not. Um, so there, there, there is no functioning market in order to adequately judge 
um, uh, internal uh, supply and demand issues to be able to set, let's say, a price or to at least determine what the adequate market price uh, should be. Uh, and then there's also the issue of perhaps you could use an international benchmark. But in terms of natural gas, there is no international benchmark uh, per se. Why? Because the natural gas sector is uh, fragmented globally. I mean, so depending on the region, you have different natural gas prices. And then the majority of natural gas um, uh, export contracts are bilaterally uh, negotiated. So that means that the price is bilaterally set, um, depending on the negotiating power of uh, various uh, parties. So um, there is no really international benchmark for uh, natural gas prices. So the, the, these are the two uh, main issues in, in trying to determine um, what exactly these countries are doing with their uh, energy uh, pricing uh, framework. Um, but nonetheless, we can say that these are regulated or administrative prices, meaning that these prices are not set by um, let's say supply and demand or by market forces are set by uh, the government. And then there is another uh, crucial issue, at least uh, for the Gulf countries. Seeing that natural gas is, I uh, guess, thank you. Uh, well, I, I should make this brief. But seeing that natural gas is uh, mostly, at least in the GCC, uh, is from associate natural gas. So the gas that's produced is from associated, uh, associated uh, reservoirs, meaning that's produced alongside of uh, oil. So uh, seeing that um, once you have the capital infrastructure in place to produce the oil, then each incremental unit of natural gas that you produce is basically has no uh, cost associated with it. So it's almost looked at as a free by byproduct. Uh, so seeing that's the case, then the average price of natural gas within the region of about a dollar dollar and fifty cents per MBTU, and I'm talking about the Gulf region, uh, that is not necessarily below the cost of production for associated natural gas, even though it's still a regulated price. However, seeing that most of these countries are currently going through an energy crisis at the moment, and that they are turning to the LNG market to import natural gas at much higher prices than what they supply the natural gas with to the domestic market, then this price differential would definitely be by you know, any definition you want to use, uh, a subsidy. And then also uh, the fact that these non-associated complex natural gas reservoirs are being brought online with the production cost several fold higher than the previous associate natural gas reservoirs. If that pricing framework is still kept in place, then uh, there would be uh, quite a significant differential between the cost of production of these complex natural gas reservoirs, oftentimes six or seven, eight dollars per well or per MMBTU, excuse me, uh, to the you know uh, prevalent uh, uh, natural gas price in the region, which is about a hundred. Uh, I'm sorry, dollar fifty cents uh, per MMBTU. Uh, now, um, I think I should finish there. I, I did have a few points for potential strategies for reformation, but I, I think I can. We can take that up that in later. the Q and A. Yes. So, uh, with that, uh, let me turn uh, to Dr. Malik. Uh, welcome uh, via Skype. Uh, we really would be very interested in hearing your views on, on the subsidy issue, and particularly since you've been associated with this uh, in the case of Jordan, uh, uh, we look forward to hearing you. So please. Uh, thank you, Martin. Uh, good morning, everybody from Jordan. And uh, uh, I'm already happy to be with you. Well, uh, you know, I always was a believer of that subsidy does not really help the country in any way. And uh, uh, usually subsidy, as it was mentioned, it only benefit the rich and not the poor. And this is why you have a lot of resistance to move subsidy uh, from uh, different countries in, in the region. Uh, you know, I always say Jordan went through three honeymoons uh, concerning energy prices. The first one is when we had low prices from the Gulf region, and the second one is when we got uh, our the supply from Iraq practically for free. And then the third one is uh, uh, low prices natural gas from Egypt. And as any honeymoon, it usually uh, stays for one month time, and then you start facing actual problems. Uh, <laughs> and every, you know, the political resistance to to, to, to remove subsidy. This is very important. Uh, uh, in Jordan, usually who benefit from the, the subsidy are the rich, the people who are living in, you know, uh, 10,000 square foot uh, uh, accommodation, have a couple of four wheel drives, which they are uh, all guzzling, uh, you know, vehicles and so on. And it had, there was, 
if you know, you should really take a, a, a courageous decision and say this is the way it should be done. Uh, unfortunately, Jordan have not done that till you know the last uh, uh, few years. Uh, uh, Jordan went through an experience in the late uh, uh, 2000, uh, sorry, 1990, where uh, the removal of subsidy in bread was imposed or subsidy was removed, but what they have done at that time, the government is actually paid who deserve the subsidy before they increase the prices. So the people felt that, you know, uh, or the people who benefited, the, uh, who should benefit from the subsidy see that this is the best way of doing uh, things. Uh, unfortunately, after the first Gulf War and after the increase in prices and then the uh, uh, you know, this, uh, the supply of natural gas from Egypt, Jordan was under a very, very heavy burden concerning the energy prices. Just to give you a few numbers, uh, NIPCO alone, which is the uh, company in charge of distributing electricity, and the, uh, it's the, uh, the sole distributor of electricity in Jordan for, uh, or transporting electricity for the distributors, uh, and they, they are in the red now about 4 billion JD, which is about $6 billion. And if we did not take action last year, this number would be higher. Even with the action that were taken last year, by 2017, the, 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 uh, the company would be in red by about 7.5 billion JD, which is about $11 billion. This is really a, a, a very bad situation. But at least Jordan took the decision in terms of uh, removing subsidy from uh, fuel products, uh, uh, petroleum products for car, diesel, and uh, kerosene, that it's not subsidized now. And uh, uh, the poor people, or the people who deserve subsidy, get their subsidy in cash uh, three times a year based on their financial situation. And it worked perfectly. Every month, the Ministry of uh, Energy, uh, you know, uh, announced the new prices based on the international prices uh, uh, a month ago. And so it has been working fine. People are accepting that. And uh, the government have been able to really uh, relieve that pressure on its budget. Unfortunately, in the electricity sector, this has not been done. Last year, we tried to remove subsidy uh, more aggressively. Uh, unfortunately, there was a lot of resistance uh, from people who benefit from subsidy. But at least we have been able to remove subsidy that the government used to get. We uh, removed the practical subsidy on uh, people who use a lot of electricity, domestic or industrial. But still, we need to, 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 to remove the subsidy. And we should increase the utilization of renewable energy, because now, in Jordan, utilizing wind power and utilizing solar and DB technology actually costs less than using uh, conventional fuels especially if you were using diesel. And now with the situation in Iraq, uh, we don't get heavy fuel anymore. So we are relying on diesel. No gas from Egypt, so diesel is the main uh, fuel for power generation. And it's really, really expensive. And the subsidy is very high. So I feel that there should be courageous uh, decision all over the region, even uh, uh, in the world, that subsidy has to be removed. <coughs> but there, there should be more of uh, you know steps that uh, be done before the subsidy uh, removal. And thank you for having me in this, uh, in my opinion, a very important uh, discussion. Well, thank you very much, Malik. Um, and thanks to all of our, the panelists. I think we covered a lot of ground. Um, in, before we take up the q and I just uh, would like to make three points that have come up, which I would like to just stress and see whether the reactions of the panelists are to this. The first one is the political economy issue. And I think 
just you uh, pointing that out and Malik pointed out uh, as well. Um, the fact of the matter is that when you think of political opposition to removal of subsidies in the MENA countries, whether it's oil exporting or oil importing, um, the political opposition uh, comes not just from the poor, not just from the lower income groups. I mean, it's, it's what Justin, you called a social contract with the population at large. When people believe that in the case of oil and gas, even in the oil producers, believe it's the part of their patrimony. Similarly, in the Republican governments, it was considered a, a contract between the ruler and the population. So when you, when you hear about opposition to political, uh, a political opposition to removal of subsidies, the, the most vehement political opposition in these countries comes from the middle income groups and even higher income groups. And they have a, a lot of power in these countries. So, you know, I think um, it's, it's something to keep in mind that simply doing a cash transfer to the poor uh, people will not just completely eliminate political opposition. It may reduce political opposition from the lower income groups, but not necessarily from the others, because they are not benefiting. So you get into strange situations like the case of Iran, Justin, where they paid everyone, uh, in fact. Uh, to, and so what, what does that mean? Uh, you're back and you're still subsidizing, in other words. So that's one point. Daniela, I have a, a question for you, which I think is worth, well, I'm sure in the report there's a distinction being made between the oil importers and the, uh, and the oil exporters in terms of the fiscal implications. Uh, fiscal costs of, of uh, subsidies. And that is that in the case of oil importers, uh, the oil imported countries that we're concerned with, there's obviously a direct fiscal effect. There's an increase in spending because of subsidies. In some cases, it's huge. Um, you know, and you know, 25% of Egypt's budget going into subsidies is clearly a huge expenditure. So there's a direct fiscal effect. Uh, and you can see, you know, expenditures rising, the fiscal deficit rising. I think we have to make a distinction between them and the oil exporters, and that is that for the oil exporting countries, it's an indirect effect. It's a loss of potential revenue. It's not an expenditure, because they, they actually are not spending. They were producing at, and they're selling, as you pointed out, Justin, above the cost of production. As long as you're doing that, then there is no explicit subsidy going on. What is happening is that you're losing potential revenue because the cost of that price is well below the price that the exporter could get on the international markets. And I think that's a distinction that has to be kept in mind. And it's sometimes, I think, from a policy point of view, at least it was my experience when I was in the IMF, from a policy point of view, it's very difficult to convince the authorities in the oil exporting countries that, you know, this is a subsidy you have to reduce it. It's uh, much easier to make the case in the oil importing countries. So, you know, I'd appreciate any reaction to that. And my final point, Justin, for you is, is I, I, I think it's very provocative for you to say that the era of subsidization is dead. Uh, I think it's, it may be uh, the realization that subsidies can no longer go on is probably more widespread now than it ever was. But you know, I mean, I've been working recently on, on two countries, Libya and Algeria, where in the, 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 the topic that you had chosen, in the area of, in the era, in the area of natural gas, uh, the wholesale pr uh, price for natural gas in Libya and Algeria is one-fifth of the wholesale price in Qatar. And Qatar, of course, has the third largest reserves of natural gas in the world. It is the largest exporter of natural gas. So these two countries actually have set prices at one-fifth. They're, they're among the lowest in the world, of course, uh, at one-fifth. And, uh, and I think that, so, so I would take slight issue with your, your characterization that, uh, this is, that, uh, that the subsidy beast has been slain. Uh, you know, you have perhaps attacked the subsidy beast in the various countries, but it's not there. So, um, can I, uh, I, I know there isn't really a question there, but I mean, I, I was wondering whether the panel would agree with my characterization that, that on the political economy issue, 
it's not just simply a matter of convincing the, the lower income groups that, you know, we will substitute subsidies, uh, cash transfers for subsidies. But the opposition is how, well, the main uh, effort has to be on how to convince the middle income and higher income groups of the rest of the population that is benefiting from these subsidies. And maybe I can start in reverse order and ask Malik uh, what you think of, of my characterization. Well, uh, I, I really uh, agree with you to a certain extent, but uh, Mohsen, I have been doing some work with some of the Gulf uh, uh, countries, and uh, as you mentioned, uh, the Emirates. You know, uh, uh, Emirates doesn't have natural gas, so they import all their natural gas for power generation. And now there it is a serious problem because uh, uh, you know, they import gas as two to three dollars per million, per million BTU from copper. And now copper is thinking of changing their prices to reflect the international prices. And that's actually going to be a burden even for a country such as, uh, uh, you know, the Emirates. Kuwait is also thinking in the uh, same terms. So, uh, you know, subsidy is wrong. Uh, anyway, it should be uh, taken off. And also, when you look at the prices of diesel in the Emirates, uh, because their refinery does not reduce diesel, produce diesel, they are the same as international prices, so, so it's not subsidized. So, uh, uh, you know, even the Gulf countries uh, have, uh, uh, you know, problems with subsidy, because some of them, they don't produce the commodity they want. They, uh, they need to use. And in my opinion, uh, the, the concept of because, you know, oil is available in, in that country should be at a lower price, I think you should alleviate the, 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 the benefit for the citizen not by subsidizing oil, but by doing other things uh, which, you know, it's not the issue of discussion in this uh, meeting. Thank you, Malik. Uh, Dustin? Oh, sure, absolutely. Um, well, I thought you brought up a point about um, opposition, and opposition, of course, is, is, is uh, quite an important issue, uh, particularly in these days of the uh, Arab Spring or perhaps the Arab Winter. Um, Although opposition, we need to characterize what exactly the nature of opposition is. Uh, opposition from the middle classes, of course, and middle and professional and upper classes uh, may be more influential in, let's say, the hallowed halls of government in these uh, countries. Um, and they have a disproportionate influence, let's say, of the creation of policy. Although I don't think that governments fear them. I, I, I think that the fear comes from having millions of the dispossessed and dis. Uh, uh, disenchanted, perhaps, and disaffected, and what have you, on the streets and uh, rioting and protesting, and what have you, and that causes collapse of, of, of government. So, uh, definitely, there is a disproportionate influence from the upper classes, and, and they do hold the ear of the governments. Uh, although, I think that street protests, uh, at least in the era of the Arab uh, Spring, are quite um, a threat, I would say, at least uh, in the eyes of, of many of the, the governments. And then also, you have uh, the opposition coming from large-scale industrial users as well. Um, and these large-scale industrial users grew fat on uh, below, you know, to use this term market price, priced uh, natural gas. And uh, they think, they, they, they really don't want to become more competitive, to be honest, because it will require uh, fairly significant large capital outlays in order to, to, to achieve this. Uh, so I suppose one of the ways that you'd be able to mitigate that, at least from their side, uh, is to um, if you increase prices, and many of uh, the large-scale industrial users are ready for that if supplies can be guaranteed uh, because there have been supply disruptions. So he said they'd be, they will willingly pay higher prices if supplies can be guaranteed. Um, so they're, they're willing to do that. I think that if you increase prices, perhaps there could be some type of framework set up for tax grants or, um, or uh, uh, financial grants or what have you. Uh, to uh, many of these large-scale industrial users to help for the purchase of energy-efficient industrial equipment mm -hmm. according to ISO uh, standards. And then that would go a long way towards making them much more efficient mm -hmm. and competitive. And uh, just a brief point, if we look at Oman in terms of opposition, there was um, opposition actually in Oman for the, let's say, uh, uh, for the uh, evolution of its energy subsidization program. But interestingly enough, uh, Omanis were on the street protesting because 
they viewed that these joint ventures with um, oftentimes they were Indian um, uh, fertilizer companies, uh, they thought that they were getting the benefit of the low um, international price natural gas feedstock. So they're protesting actually against these companies uh, receiving natural gas feedstock at uh, fairly low prices, and they want the price prices to be increased, actually. Uh, so that, that, that was quite an uh, interesting development, and it's actually a popular uh, uh, protest. And if I could just be brief, you, you did mention about um, uh, about uh, whether this beast is dead. Well, I, actually, maybe I should characterize it as a hydra in terms of uh, subsidization as, or Medusa, perhaps, as opposed to uh, 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 just uh, one unitary beast. But um, I did mean to be provocative. That, that, that was my intent. Although um, I, I, I do think, though, that we must consider the fact that um, even though prices are low uh, in, uh, let's say, quite low in, in, in many of the countries and only about three four countries we could say have engaged in, um, let's say, decisive uh, natural gas reformation. You see, once there's a transition from associate natural gas, which is what the majority of Algerian gas production is at the moment, to non-associate complex natural gas, where the production cost is going to be sevenfold higher, and um, basically the national oil companies don't have the expertise to produce from these non-associated fields, and they need to call in the majors to produce from these fields, but the majors are not going to produce from these fields as long as the terms of investment are still what they are, meaning that they can't export, they need to supply the domestic market at these extremely low prices, and uh, none of these companies are going to subsidize the internal gas consumption of these countries. Uh, so in order for Algeria, for instance, to produce from its uh, shale gas reservoirs, it had to reform its terms of investment. And the terms of investment, meaning that the international oil companies are going to receive a higher price for investing and producing from these fields, that's the first step towards, I think, more comprehensive reformation, at least from the production side as opposed to the cons consumption side. Uh, thank you, Justin. I think uh, Algeria, in that case, is also going to have, in terms of investment, uh, its terms of investment also have to change to allow for majority ownership by foreigners. Right now, they have this rule that it can only be a minority state. Daniela. OK. Um. The issue of the political economy and who is going to uh, lose the most, if you will, and object the most. I think you're absolutely right. The poor are not the people that benefit the most. And they, even though uh, they can protest, they have not historically been the most vocal uh, social group in, in, in these countries. I would argue, however, two things. One is that the need for adequate social protection is it's a need uh, that goes beyond uh, mm -hmm. buying in certain segment of population. These are groups that <coughs> could be significantly affected uh, by higher prices, even though their consumption of this product is limited. And they need support for um, social and economic reasons, not only to uh, co-op them in a sense to support the reform. So I, I think that recognizing that other groups are going to be vocal, um, uh, vocally against reform does not at all change the terms of the case for adequate social protection for the poor. Now, the question remains then how do you address the concerns of those that are not poor, that benefit extensively uh, from subsidies because they consume significantly more. Uh, and I think Dr. Malek made a very um, persuasive case that this is, in fact, true in the majority of these countries. Now, I think there have been a number of surveys, for example, of opinion in the region. There have been a lot of um, uh, discussion about what is, it, what, is it, what is the stake of the middle class for successful subsidy reform. And I think um, what Justin mentioned, addressing shortages, blackouts, providing a steady supply of electricity and, and predictable supply of fuel is a very important element. I think, secondly, uh, the importance of the government being um, trusted, being persuasive when they plan, uh, when they announce plan to use savings from uh, these subsidies towards things that are extremely important to the middle class in this region, such as health and education. 
is again a very another very important uh, item. And then, of course, there are countries. Um, Jordan is one of them. Iran, I think, the one that has, as you mentioned, done most uh, comprehensively. That have also uh, provided cash um, transfers beyond <coughs> poor segment of population to the middle class to facilitate their transition and adjustment. And I would argue that why these uh, need, of course, to be managed very carefully because they can turn into enormously expensive propositions. There's still <coughs> an improvement of our subsidies because at least they do not foster overconsumption with the yields that, again, uh, Justin <coughs> mentioned earlier. So I think, I don't think that this is something that in itself should prevent reform from, from going forward. The second point you made was on the oil exporters. Of course, there are a very different uh, set of countries from oil importers. Of course, the fiscal pressures are much less um, uh, immediate, although if you look at the medium term, even the GCC countries face significant fiscal pressure uh, at current policies. And I think um, from a distortion uh, and domestic investment point of view, they face even bigger uh, challenges than, uh, than the oil importers. A lot of their industries are, in fact, um, directly uh, related to, um, to oil, whether they're petrochemical, and again, uh, Justin made the case in his introduction. So addressing those distortions, ensuring that domestic investment is profitable at market prices and doesn't subtract uh, revenues from other experts, it's, I think it's something that's quite high on their agenda. And we have seen um, Saudi Arabia uh, beginning to increase electricity prices to non-residential users. We have seen uh, Bahrain uh, taking steps. We have seen Qatar taking steps. Kuwait has announced, even though not yet implemented, increase in actually the removal of subsidies on diesel fuel. So, we haven't seen action, but we are certainly beginning to see a debate on what needs to be done, how it can be implemented, how the benefits can be mobilized. So I would be more, more uh, optimistic than you, even though, as you said, absolutely, the pressure is not going to come so much from the fiscal side, at least not in the media. Is the beast dead? No. We are here, you know, all in full, uh, in full armor, uh, still fighting, fighting the beast. But I think that the general atmosphere in the region has really shifted between, you know, why, why do we need to do this? Why should we do this? To, you know, we need to do this. What's the best way forward? How can we do it in a way that ensures that the poor are not um, unduly burden that ensures that the middle class has a stake, that the industry can actually benefit uh, from, from the removal of this subsidy to that. So I'm, I'm optimistic. Yeah. Well, thank you, Rosa. Let me now open up the floor for Q&A. And uh, if you could just identify yourself. There are mics that will come around if you have any questions. So right at the back, next to you, Omar. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Gita Mercedes with the Voice of America. I have a question about Iran, uh, which you also mentioned briefly here. Um, well, we know Iran's economy is very, very sick due to a number of reasons. However, uh, what has uh, President Rouhani done since coming into office with regards to the subsidies program to improve the economy of the country? What should Iranians be expecting in the future, near future, preferably? Thank you. Thank you. So, who's going to take that up? Uh, Daniela? Or? I don't know that I can speak very confidently about Iran uh, reform program and, and challenges comprehensively. Of course, Iran has taken uh, very important steps in the subsidy reform area. Uh, the reforms that were launched in Iran in 2010 were, in fact, the first comprehensive reform of, of um, energy subsidies that we have seen in the region. Unfortunately, those reforms, have, as you implied, have not been completed. And recent steps have been taken by the new government to, 
um, to advance that reform. Iran is a very interesting country in that um, it's a producer, and Justin may have some, some comments on, on Iran on, on, on that side. But Iran is also very interesting um, in that it has provided very extensive cash compensation to the population, not just to the poor, but basically to everybody. And that has had um, fiscal consequences that I think were larger than what was initially expected, and that will need to be, to be dealt with in the future. Um, but I should stay away from commenting on the program, at, you know, the economic program at large, because I'm really not the best person to do so. Justin, did you want to? Yes, I mean, did just a few brief uh, comments, and again, I, I prefer I concur, excuse me, with uh, Daniela. I focus much more on the Arab world. Um, but um, now that uh, there is, I guess, some type of thaw in the relationship, let's say, between Iran and, and the West, and I think that this will be the driver towards, at least from the production side, uh, opening up. And we saw that uh, Iran has uh, revised its contractual terms, or terms of investment for IOCs to get in and aggressively begin to produce from its oil and natural uh, gas uh, fields. And you see, Iran also wants to be a major player in the LNG market. Market, uh, as well, seeing that it has a significant portion of what is known as comprehensively as North Dome Field, which is split between the maritime boundaries of Qatar being the North Field and, of course, South Cars on the Iranian side. So uh, Iran really wants to begin uh, producing LNG, although I, it, it is a bit um, odd uh, because it's much more difficult to produce nuclear energy from scratch rather than LNG. So, the, so sometimes you have to ask where your priorities are at, I, I suppose. Um, if you put a national collective effort, let's say, towards producing LNG, perhaps something that could have been done indigenously. But um, that's not my call to make. And um, Iran, as well, is, is uh, facing uh, the same issues that most of the air energy rich countries are also facing, the sense of the natural gas crisis and, and overall energy crisis. Uh, so Iran is in that position whereby it's an exporter at the same time it's an importer as well. I mean, so whenever you see a country that has prodigious amounts of natural gas, but at the same time it must import, then you know that something is, 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 um, is wrong, something is out of whack uh, within uh, that country's energy sector. And that is the case for Iran. So I, I, I do see that there will be some type of comprehensive uh, reform coming soon, uh, if only for the fact that Iran needs to increase its uh, natural gas production and to encourage and attract uh, the international players to get in and aggressively invest. Um, Manik, do you have any views on, on the Iran? Yeah. If you don't mind, I had a meeting with the Minister of Energy, uh, the Iranian Minister of Energy last year, and uh, he just mentioned that after subsidy, the consumption on different kind of, uh, you know, energy product have uh, went down between 10 and 20 percent. So it seems subsidy work. This is, of course, according to the information he conveyed to me. So. It seems subsidy worked somehow, uh, or the movement of subsidy worked somehow by direct uh, payment to, in the case of Iran, to everybody, but uh, at least for the low and medium income uh, citizen of Iran. Thank you, Malik. Um, um, yeah, I have uh, John, John Iskander. Uh, there's a mic just by you. Thank you. Uh, John Iskander from the Foreign Service Institute. Uh, thanks for this event. Um, I think uh, Mohsen and Daniela, you have both hit on this question of the real hit that the middle class feels. And I think this is something that, in terms of the political economy, thinking of it in terms of stability, but also in terms of the real impact to normal people, um, I think it's it really is problematic to focus on the poor. I mean, I was just in Amman recently, and I'm no expert on, uh, on Jordanian political economy or political economy, um, but there was a lot of anxiety expressed in Amman uh, about the coming hikes in cost of electricity. And the people who feel that anxiety, I'm sure, are the poor, but that's not who I was hearing from. I was hearing from the Jordanian workers at the U.S. Embassy, right? I mean, so these are people who are squarely in the middle class, presumably, right? I mean, they're certainly making more than minimum wage. They're doing okay, uh, but life is not easy for them. I, I'm sure I don't need uh, to tell anyone here, it's, you know, life is often quite difficult for those middle classes. 
And so when we focus on, on the poor, we're missing all of those people who are looking, I think, at, at huge hikes in potential electricity costs, which was a real threat to their sort of livelihoods and their stability in the middle class. And this is true, of course, in Egypt and, and other places as well, that those middle classes are often, I think, not comfortable middle classes. And so how does a, is there, in fact, so talking about Iran extending perhaps too far, one could argue, but what's, what is, is there any model of, of something that really goes beyond the real poor and yet is somehow still fiscally sustainable since we all recognize that ultimately there is a fiscal issue uh, here? Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, Marek, you wanted to, to respond to yeah, me? Of course, I, I, I would love to do that because, uh, you know, I, I'm really uh, puzzled by that because, you know, in the past couple of years, Jordan have done an excellent job in terms of introducing renewable energy uh, where, uh, you know, there's no income tax, there's no import uh, duties, uh, you can sell the extra uh, electricity you generate to the distributing company. Just let, let me give you my case. I live in about 2,000 uh, square meter, uh, square foot apartment, 200 square meter apartment. Actually, I'm paying about $6 a month for electricity because actually I'm selling back electricity with an investment of about $7,000. Uh, you know, the problem with some of the people they have been using to using uh, electricity at a very, very low price. You know, it is only, you know, people who use less than 300 kilowatt hour per month, they pay about only 20% to 30% of the cost of power generating. Uh, you know, uh, also all energy conservation uh, uh, equipment like lighting, uh, insulation, double glazing, all of these, uh, uh, all import duty and state tax and, you know, everything was removed. So people just have to adjust. Energy is not cheap anymore. We cannot keep living the old good days where per oil was $12 or $15. Things have changed. So everybody has to change, and you can do a good job. You don't have to drive. You know, you have been in Jordan. A lot of people driving this street before we drive. Why? I drive a nice, small Prius Toyota, which I fill it up with, you know, fuel uh, once every two weeks. So people have to change. We cannot keep complaining about the situation unless we practice <coughs> what we preach. They have to do that. So uh, I'm really amazed by these people complaining, which uh, the people you're talking about are, you know, on a high level of the uh, medium income uh, uh, citizen. We don't want to change. We want to live, uh, uh, you know, uh, business as usual. So they have to change their lifestyle when it comes to energy consumption. Thank you, Malik. Uh, yeah. Then for me, an opportunity for further advertisement. Uh, <laughs> so I couldn't pass. Yeah? Um, you have to we did. We prepared another paper, uh, which uh, we presented um, in April. Um, but it was also the constituted also one of the inputs to a conference we held in Amman in May, which looks at essentially what do these countries need to accelerate growth and to generate jobs. Now, the middle class clearly stands to lose more from the elimination of subsidies than the poor people, simply because they consume more electricity, they consume more fuel, etc. Ca all the cases that Dr. Mark made. There are also those parts of population that have been starved of good job opportunities, uh, that have invested in education of their children and not reap the rewards from their investment in the education of their children, they have a big stake on a whole package of reforms that can change the growth part of the region from a lukewarm 3% to twice as much and even more. I mean, these are countries where there is potential for real growth that can generate real sustainable jobs. Subsidy reform is a small piece of the puzzle, but it's a very important one to unlock public sector resource 
as I said earlier, to provide better health and education services, to invest in infrastructure that's needed to make industry more competitive, to reduce the shortages of the blackouts, the, the unreliable supply of electricity. So I, I don't think that we should look at sub sub reform is extremely important, but let's not look at it as the end all of what's need to be done to lead to a successful, vibrant, lively, happy middle class in the region, which we all, I think, agree is going to be necessary for success, for economic success. Thank so you. For the advertisement. Uh, yes, at the back, uh, the lady at the back. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, Professor Diane Singerman from American University. Um, I, I have two questions. The first is I'm a little confused at the sort of political triggers and, and politically how this is supposed to happen because Justin mentioned, of course, the um, it's not just energy subsidies, it's land subsidies, it's low wages of a whole private and public sector, industrial sector that actually benefits tremendously from these subsidies. And so we're talking about the poor, we're talking about the middle class, but these regimes, these governments have made, uh, as, as, as we hear about the renewables, they've made all kinds of uh, incentives to bring industry, which includes low energy costs, low wages, free land, et cetera. So I'm just wondering politically, do you see this discussion and this reduction of subsidies as somehow externally generated? Or do you see the very strong political and private sector and public sector supporters of regimes that have been resurgent in the region, whether through um, alliances with the military now, as we see in Egypt or in other places, how is this very important sector that you don't really see so much when you guys are talking about opposition? What kind of opposition forces do we, do we see in the Gulf? What kind of opposition forces do we see elsewhere? But it's this, this very powerful um, industrial sector, which also benefits from these subsidies, we don't see where their opposition comes from. And then the second question is just a question about renewables, which I think is really important throughout the region, and it seems sort of paradoxical that on one hand we're talking about um, oil exporting and, 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 and countries in some sense with rentier economies which don't seem to really have a big interest in, in energy renewables and solar energy, et cetera. And we just saw the last struggle in Egypt where the Minister of Environment lost, lost the debate about importing coal to Egypt in order to, uh, in, in order to uh, uh, provide supplies. So I just wonder, in the region as a whole, is there a demand side for renewables? Is there, um, are there uh, opposition groups, environmental movements, et cetera, et cetera, uh, which, are, which, which the, the government might, might seem to, to promote more? Um, and then I, I think that's just the last comment. I think when we're talking about subsidies uh, and we talk about does it affect the poor, the middle class? We also have to talk about transparency. We also have to talk about the right to information because a lot of people feel this is just blatantly unfair. And with rentier economies and with no oppositions and monarchies, they have no information about these kinds of things. There's no transparency about these. And that's what also generates a tremendous feeling of, of inequity. Thank you. Thank you. If I can just ask for a point of clarification, what, what exactly uh, did you mean by where the opposition comes from in terms of the industrial sector and the GCC? What, 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 what did you Not mean by that? Not just the GCC, but the rest of the region where you have uh, private sector groups, you have industry, the petrochemicals, et cetera. Well, so the industry is so from, 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 from the subsidies. From the right. Whether okay. it's public yeah. sector or private sector. I see. Okay. Uh, can, can we, let's take a, a, a couple of questions and so that we can have a, um, yes, uh, Amy over there. Thank you very much, Amy Hawthorne from the Hariri Center. Given what you've said about uh, best practices in energy subsidy reform, how would you characterize uh, Egypt's uh, move so far to restructure its uh, fuel subsidies? How would you assess the success of that so far in terms of a public policy approach? Good. Um, yeah, uh, the gentleman over there. I'll, I'll get to you, don't, don't worry. Uh, I've, I've seen you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Hi, Ryan McClanahan with the U.S. Institute of Peace. Uh, I was just curious, the, the military is often a very powerful political economic uh, uh, actor inside most of these countries. So I was just wondering, uh, in your studies, if you had seen, what you had seen about the relationship between the size and uh, influence and nature of the military and security forces um, with uh, the success or likelihood of uh, subsidy reforms. Thank you. Thank 
It's you. All right, I got you. <laughs> Stay right to the mic. <laughs> You've been waiting patiently, so go ahead. Hi, my name is Nathan Copeland uh, from New Rules for Global Finance. Um, so I hope my questions are already addressed, so I'll not ask those again. Uh, but I think the public perception point that was made is really important. Um, but just a question of clarification. When you say that the large beneficiaries of fuel subsidies are the upper middle and upper class, do you mean in absolute terms or in relative terms? Because a portion of your income, your disposable income, if you're poor, is probably maybe higher if you spend on you know, a gallon of fuel or a liter of fuel than it is if you spend you know, in absolute terms more, um, but it's less as a percentage of your income if you're a wealthier person. Thank you. Um, any other? Yeah, please. Um, Tyler Holt with USAID. Actually, my question, it's been a very good discussion, so thanks. It's been interesting. But my question is more about the political economy. Does the IMF follow a particular framework or uh, you know, use a tool? Or are we just sort of you're using the term political economy to discuss you know, the sensitivities of policy reform? So particularly for uh, subsidy reform, is there a particular model or framework that you're using to analyze these issues? Good. Um, so we have a, a, a bunch of questions and, and comments. Um, I think uh, I'll turn it over to, to you all to answer. But I think one of the questions that, that I suppose is on people's minds is the one that Amy Hawthorne raised, which is, you know, given the, the sort of views on subsidy reform, and Malik, you would also be uh, welcome your views on this. Giving you the views on subsidy reform, what sort of an optimal reform should be, how would you characterize the recent moves in, in Egypt uh, over the past weekend in, in terms of, of that kind of uh, framework? So, please. Daniela? You want me to start? Very good. Um, I should start with Egypt then. Egypt has. Um, introduces, you all know, very large um, increases in prices of fuel over the weekend. We have not been able to analyze those fully, and I would not want to say that these are the, uh, you know, what their fiscal effects will be or what. I, we just don't have had the time to analyze those. But in terms of the lessons that we've done from the work that we've done, which was done before this particular episode in reform, there are at least two things that I could highlight that um, I think we need attention by the government going forward. One is that we have heard announcement of mitigation measures addressing poor people and some of the middle class. I understand that, for example, the Minister of Social Protection has talked about increasing their uh, I think it's called social solidarity pension. Um, I talked about increasing uh, wages for lower paid uh, social, uh, sorry, public sector workers. Um, I talked about increasing um, ration uh, access uh, to ration cards for food uh, subsidized prices. We certainly would, have, would encourage the government to take measures to address uh, the impact that these price increases uh, of fuel product have on the poorest. Uh, that may not be sufficient, as we discussed earlier, to address the concern of the middle class, but that is certainly going to be very important in a country where over 20% of the people are assessed to be poor. And so this is something that we very much would like to encourage the government to, to consider doing uh, in, in the short term. Also, Again, we have not said, we have not had the time and the information for its impact. But even though the price increase that has taken place is being <coughs> very significant, um, we know that it started from a very low base, and that further price increases will be needed if, in fact, <coughs> Egypt decides to raise fuel uh, prices to uh, world, to international levels. And we should encourage them also, based on the lessons that we have learned from looking at the countries that have been able to um, initiate subsidy reform and do this successfully, is to really have a debate about it, be 
um, clear as to clear upfront as to um, what what are the implications that they expect from these price increases? Be clear about what remedial measures they are planning to take in regard to consumer, in the regard to industrial producer, um, and communicate. I guess would be the short, the short word. You know, mitigate and communicate. I think are the two things that we should encourage the government of Egypt to go uh, to focus on going forward. There will be other messages, but. I'm sure, but we will need to, to, to take the time to really understand what the impact is, especially at the fiscal level uh, of these measures. Daniel, can I, can I just, you know, it's not Egypt, can I just push you a little bit on sure. that? Because uh, the, one of the messages that I took, took away from your, your excellent report and, and it was that uh, the, in the keys to successful subsidy reforms has to be preparing the public and an information campaign that convinces the public. Uh, I didn't see that in Egypt. Uh, up until last week, uh, they, didn't, they, they talked about subsidy reforms, and then they backtracked, which I've been following. And then they announced it uh, overnight. So That's what they said. We should certainly encourage them to communicate more. <laughs> but I mean, it's sort of after the the horse is bolted, <laughs> in no, some sense. Before, <laughs> before, when, and after. I think uh, these are not these are big issues. Um, we've talked about this, you know, uh, subsidies being part of the social contract. Long history. Uh, Dr. Malik talked about honeymoons, right? This is this is not something that will go. The beast is not dead, right? This will not go away. We need to increase transparency, <coughs> I forgot who raised the issue of transparency, we need to raise transparency about who benefits from them, um, how we're going to address their legitimate concern, how we're going to benefit, to have people benefit from the savings we're going to achieve, how we're going to encourage, I mean, Dr. Malik talked about it, um, from uh, investments to take advantage of the removal of this distortions. There is a whole set of things we need to talk about. We need to talk about before, during, after. So I'm sorry, I was just, no, I was no, just no. pushing you a bit on this. Um, and just, I, I would like to ask Malik, what did you think, uh, Malik, about the, the announcements in Egypt on, on removal of subsidies or increases in electricity prices and fuel prices? Uh, I worked with the Egyptian government uh, a long time ago when I was the president of the National Energy Research Center. And I think it's overdue. It's really overdue. This should have been done a long time ago. And uh, it, it, as I said, I'm not a believer of sub subsidies, and you don't have to talk just about subsidies. There are so many other things you have to integrate when you take such a decision. Uh, but I want to, may I uh, continue speaking? Please, please. Yeah, I, I, I want to talk about the pressure. Somebody asked about the, from, you know, high income and industry. Just to give you two examples, into the, the steel and the cement uh, industry. We have so many of them. And when they uh, done their feasibility study, they done it on an export, uh, uh, you know, basis. That they will be exporting a lot of their commodity to the region. Uh, in my opinion, uh, uh, you know, this is not the right decision. You cannot compete with the Gulf there. You cannot compete with Iraq. You cannot compete with Saudi Arabia to produce steel or cement. And then they come back and they request the government to give on the subsidy and also against these commodities that come from the neighboring country. So the private sector actually is one of the major obstacles when it comes to subsidy. Another issue, we have been able to remove import duty and sales tax on oil hydrocarbons. Then, because of the influence, they removed that. Then, uh, when I was a minister, we were talking about it. And people who resisted that were car dealers who can, who their companies or their, where they get their cars don't have hydrocarbons. So at the end of the day, these people think on a personal benefit and not the nation. You have, you know, uh, uh, ministers and decision makers in this country should really worry about the, the, the future of their country. 
and not about uh, you know just uh, the small and short gain. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Justin, you want to uh, respond to any of the questions? Sure, sure. I think, um, at least with uh, Egypt, uh, I, I, I would agree with Daniela. It's, it's much too soon. I, uh, and and I, I do have concerns as to whether it's phased or nuanced. I think uh, with the previous gentleman's question about uh, the middle class, I mean, uh, if you have a targeted, perhaps, uh, subsidy reformation program, then uh, that could go a long way towards alleviating some of the concerns of the middle class. But the thing is, you need a robust um, administrative apparatus in order to achieve that, which unfortunately many of these countries lack. So then uh, you're stuck with this uh, conundrum as to how they can go forward and properly identify and segment various uh, demographics within the country. Uh, so so that, that, that is definitely um, an issue. But in terms of communication, there really was not a communication campaign, uh, again, uh, echoing uh, course, what Boston said. Uh, but um, at least during the end of the Mubarak era, there were haphazard incremental steps to increase at the margins, uh, power prices for industrial users and certain natural gas inputs and price, feedstock prices and so on and so forth. Then, of course, Morsi was negotiating with IMF. I mean, so, so it was on people's radar that something was going to come sometime soon. And, of course, CC did give some interviews and he indicated that there is going to be some type of price or information. But I mean, there was not really an effective uh, campaign, uh, to say the least. But I mean, there is going to be pain, obviously. Uh, you, you can't escape from that. It's not going to be seamless. Uh, because the two main goals of subsidy reformation is to reduce consumption and to increase production. And uh, unfortunately, uh, there is going to be some amount of structural adjustment pain involved in the process. But the only thing you can do is try to smooth it um, away to a certain degree. Um, and then uh, just briefly, um, in terms of opposition forces, I mean, um, now the industrial users in many of the, the energy rich MENA countries uh, centered, let's say, within uh, the Gulf, uh, they have uh, grown fat, as I said before, on uh, these uh, low uh, energy prices, natural gas inputs and what have you. And um, they didn't have to be competitive. They just beat the competition based on um, you know, pricing. Um, and that's how they gain market share. And now they need to gain market share because there is increased uh, uh, competition, rivalry coming from the US with shale gas production. So in the US, there have been about 110 petrochemical projects um, either new ones or capacity expansion that have been announced within the past two years, about $77 billion uh, worth of investment, and this is only slated to increase. So there's going to be a fair amount of competition emanating from the U.S. market vis-a-vis -vis the Gulf petrochemical sector. So um, they are no longer able to just rest on their laurels on, on low natural gas uh, prices. So uh, they need to become much more competitive if they want to uh, compete with the U.S. in terms of petrochemical uh, production. Um, and and, and they, have, they are recognizing that. And, but if you look at the opposition now, um, let's say Saudi Arabia as an example, you have the Ministry of, of the Economy, and uh, they represent, let's say, the major industrial consumers. And um, these consumers, of course, they want to maintain the natural gas price, which they have grown accustomed to, um, although if you look at the major producer, of course, Aramco, and this is repeated across the region, whereas the national oil company wants the major industrial consumers to uh, purchase at uh, above the cost of production. Uh, that, that's what they want. And they, of course, have a significant uh, amount of influence within the government in, in terms of uh, being heard. And then you have the major industrial concerns as well, and they want to continue to have these low prices. So that's where the conflict arises and the opposition and to which side is going to necessarily have the ear of government uh, to be able to effectuate uh, the policy of their desire. Thank you. Yes. Uh, the very last question within the mindset. Can I have 30 seconds for that? Absolutely. The effect of these price increases on the poor. It really depends country by country, product by product. Uh, diesel tends to be the most socially sensitive because it's used in agriculture and because um, it affects the price of urban transportation that many poor used to go to work. Uh, but it does change country by country. Gasoline tends to be the least sensitive. This is the most sensitive, but it does depend on, on the consumption basket. In no country that I'm aware of, however, the poor are the largest beneficiary, whether in relative or in absolute terms. So are they the largest losers? No. no. Neither in absolute nor in relative terms. However, by, by the virtue of being poor, they cannot afford to lose. That's the point.
Very good. Well, I would like to thank uh, all of you, and I'd like to thank our, our panelists. Uh, uh, Dr. Malik, thank you very much for your interventions. Justin, it's a pleasure to, to listen to you. And Daniel, you did uh, a masterful job in explaining the position of the fund and, and in advertising your two, two books. So thank you all very much. <laughs>